power. Real power is something you take. time you have is pretty much up to you. But you've got to remember that you have just come through a very serious heart operation. You can't drive yourself the way you used to. I really wouldn't know what to do without you. Julie Gray has returned to Dallas and plots to weasel her way into seeing Jock Ewing. Pam B makes plans for doubles tennis. If Jock is aggravated, Bobby didn't wake him to round up the strays. Are you kidding me? Mom would skin me alive I wake you up early on a Sunday morning. Meanwhile, the daughters of the Alamo scheme to enact their own political agenda, perhaps using vaccines as a smokescreen to inject people with critical race theory. We've often used the organization to support our husband's positions. Exactly. But what about our positions? Chalk wanders in for a drink, but Ellie warns him off alcohol and tells him to take a nap. Outside, some rando is trying to woo Lucy into going steady with him, and then he nearly knocks the grill over with his erection. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine, when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Chalk offers to move the grill out of the way, but Lucy tells him not to exert himself. Let me move it for you, sir. At dinner, Ellie scolds Chalk for wanting salt on his food. This food's got no taste, Miss Ellie. That's a bold statement for a man with that collar. Jock, don't be difficult. They are really laying it on thick with the helplessness motif. Jock offers to drop in on JR's meeting with Seth Stone, since he wants to amend his will to include his new grandson anyway. But if it's another granddaughter, hush up, Lucy. Yeah, if you say it out loud, the baby might not be born with a penis. It's gonna be deformed. Patriarchy is so freaking weird sometimes, you know? I reckon it's not a style to say so, but I damn sure hope it's a boy. Hush up, Lucy. Finally, Jock has had enough and says he's not listening to anyone until he's dead. The day I start taking orders from anybody is the day they bury me. Please make sure your seatbelt is fastened. The day I start taking orders from anybody is the day they bury me. At the meeting, Jock continues to be frustrated by the rest of the boys rejecting his outdated method for unclogging oil wells. Feeling useless and listless, Chuck heads to the Cattlemen's Club for lunch where Julie Gray just happens to be, thanks to a tip from the Mater D. Julie apologizes for turning over the red file to Cliff Barnes and spy in the house, and Jock asks her to stay for lunch. The lunch goes so well that Jock and Julie close the place down, catching up. Julie fawns over Jock's hypermasculine exploits, boosting his ego. I don't do much of anything these days. Well, I can't believe that. Big Jock Ewan who could outrun, outwork, and outsmart any ten men put together? You don't get a lot of character development for Julie. She only has about three episodes in which she's a feature player. But this scene comes off the heels of For Love or Money, and it makes it hard not to question if she's genuinely impressed, or if like Sue Ellen and Kristen, she was just trained to stroke the male ego. What I am looking at is how hard you have worked to turn me into the perfect wife for him. And I succeeded. You've got it all ahead of you. And you don't seem very happy about it. Actually, at this moment, I'm, I'm happier than I've been in a long time. This leads to Jock spending more time with Julie and less time with his family. Bobby and Pam run into them at the Angus for an awkward reunion. When JR learns that Julie is back, he immediately suspects them of having an affair. Jock tells the boys to back off. Personal business, JR. Nothing that concerns you. JR shows up at Julie's doorstep, and Julie, I believe, is the first person to drop the name John Ross Ewing III. Julie quickly figures out that JR is just there to find out if Julie is going to tell Jock about the forged will, and to renew old acquaintances. Julie pushes him out, but not before he says he always gets what he wants. Jesus, John Ross. This scene brings up a lot, so let's stop for a moment to take a look under the manhood.
thousands of gigabytes have been spent talking about masculinity on the internet, usually badly. A lot of the talk centers on toxic masculinity, which was a relatively new term for the general public about a decade ago. Now, whenever you get a lot of lay people discussing technical terms, things get conflated and confused, and when those people have their own agendas and social media accounts, you can take it to the bank that there will be a lot of shoddy information. So let me clarify and I'll bend it back around to JR and Jock in a second. Masculinity is a set of beliefs about boys and men. These beliefs include, but are not limited to, anti-femininity, exalting adventure, risk, and competition, and avoiding the appearance of weakness. Sidebar. Have you ever run into someone who is just way too into a thing? Whether it's the Boston Bruins, or New Japan Pro Wrestling, or Nirvana, or even New Atheism, there's always got to be one guy who dares you to question him on his thing. And if you ever make the mistake of saying, oh yeah, I like Green Lantern. Really? Name the seven canonical Green Lanterns who have made their own series, in chronological order. Who stuffed Guy Gardner's girlfriend in the fridge? What was the name of the company Hal Jordan was a test pilot for? How does one become a Black Lantern? Hypermasculinity is that sort of fanaticism about masculinity. It's marked by a view of danger as being exciting, violence to solve interpersonal issues, and callous sexual attitudes toward women. So if a guy comes along who has more status, bigger muscles, a hotter girlfriend, and a bigger... gun. If you've gone all in on being a manly man, you're going to take a hit to the self-esteem. But if you're more well-rounded, you're okay recognizing that you're good at other things too. Toxic masculinity is the point at which hypermasculinity starts to hurt you or hurt the people around you. You've got to be number one! I won't tolerate any losers in this family. Win! 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 And that's where we get to Jock and JR. For all his manly thoughts, Jock's modern day masculinity only spills over into toxicity on occasion. His comments at the barbecue being one of them, and his overt preference for a male grandchild being another. This episode is the third example. Jock, for the most part, was comfortable in his masculinity by the time we met him. He knew exactly who he was, and he was fine with that. The heart attack didn't even affect that as much as the changes in the way that people looked at him. That's why Julie fulfills a need in him in this episode. He needs someone to recognize the masculine, independent traits in him, and not the frailty. John Ross Jr., on the other hand, seems wholly preoccupied with his own masculinity. He casually tosses women aside once he's done with them, he desperately wants to live up to his father's image, but without the imposing physical stature, he has to lean into the ruthlessness. And when his manhood is challenged, that's when he becomes the most toxic because he needs to prove he knows the most about Green Lantern. I guess what I'm saying is that if JR had just had some other interest besides proving himself to his hypermasculine father, most of the people around him probably would have been better off. JR, worried about Jock coming back to the office to wrest power away from him, tells Miss Ellie about Jock's friendship with Julie. Ellie tells him to back off and never speak of it again. But when she asks Jock about his whereabouts, he tells her he doesn't answer to her and that it's nothing she needs to concern herself with. Now this is where we have to introduce some nuance, and I know the internet loves nuance. Are you ready for my nuance proposal here? Are you ready for this? Both people can contribute to a bad situation in a relationship without one of them being right and one of them being wrong. And this is the important part, Twitter. You don't have to have a bad guy and a good guy. Miss Ellie has been infantilizing a grown man. Jock, don't be difficult. She's doing it out of fear and love because she doesn't want him to die, so she's not a bad person. But her actions do make him feel like less of a man, which as we discussed before means he feels less like himself. And as Sue Ellen is finding out this season, when you aren't treated like the person you think you are, it can be dysphoric. So Miss Ellie is someone whose actions are good-natured but have unintended consequences. Jock, on the other hand, knows he's wrong. You notice how open he is with people when he makes plans with Punk Anderson? Kind of get me uh, Punk Anderson on the phone, will you? If there's nothing untoward about his relationship, then you should have no problem telling Ellie he's going to have lunch with Julie. Spoiler alert, Jock and Julie's relationship never actually gets physical, but that doesn't matter. Emotional infidelity is a break in the boundaries of an exclusive relationship that is emotional but not necessarily physical or sexual. This would be the second time that this has happened for a Ewing man this season. Jock is having an affair with Julie. That's the bottom line. And that's something that Miss Ellie discovers when she confronts Julie about it later. Jock is absent from dinner despite an ultimatum that he be there or else. 
At dinner, JR demands a plan of action for Miss Ellie, but she tells him to mind his own business, again, and storms out. This triggers a near brawl between Bobby and JR as Bobby accuses him of meddling in their parents' marriage. Bobby, wait a minute! Bobby, don't! This leads to my favorite callback of the second season as Pamela tells Ellie the story of a woman who loved an indecisive man and decided to take a horsewhip to him to help him decide who he wanted to be with. She's here, Pam. Ellie, all juiced up from the pep talk, storms over to Julie's to confront both of them. But in the end, Jock couldn't make dinner because he was breaking things off with Julie. Jock apologizes to Ellie for hurting her, and she accepts her role in driving him away. It's a moment so sweet and healthy that it's almost jarring to see amidst all the dysfunction at South Fork. As a coda, JR breaks into Julie's apartment and they wind up in a passionate embrace. There isn't that much more to say that hasn't already been said other than, I have to take a moment to marvel at how well the showrunners weaved multiple storylines together in this episode. Bypass set two threads in motion that keep getting sprinkled in throughout the other plots. First is Jock's struggle with his masculinity and second is the Red File a forged copy of Jock's will that allows JR and his cronies to drill on South Fork. Both of those will get resolved here and over the next two-part episode, thanks to the re-emergence of Julie Gray. Perhaps no character has had such an impact in so little time as Julie. More to come in the next episodes, but this is a good one. And it's great to see a satisfactory payoff for Jock and Ellie. Hey, do you like puppets? Do you like wholesome messages delivered to the tune of indisputable bangers? Then check out Street's reviews of the childhood classic Fraggle Rock, linked right here. Oh, and I know that you love southern sociopaths hell-bent on ruining people's lives in a quest for power, so you might also want to check out my series on the Sam Raimi cult hit American Gothic, linked right here. I'll be back in a few weeks as we find out what happened with that red file.